good. Excellent. So my name is Michael Randolph. I'm with the Center for Nonprofit and Community Development. And among the different types of programs that we do is how to establish your nonprofit and how to fund it. Okay, so just to keep y'all in tune with what I'm doing, I'm hitting the button to click. It's taking its own time to move. So just give me one second. There we go. Oh man, it's like it ran all the way around the corner. <laughs> so we strengthen organizations that uh, strengthen community at the end of the day. That's what we do. And we do it, of course, in a way that is innovative, practical, and top quality in terms of our products. So let's talk about all of the services that we do provide. We provide professional uh, grant writing, those who want to buy the grant, business uh, proposal preparation, program and project development and evaluation. That's important because if you got a program, and if it's not what's known as a best practice program, then the likelihood of getting that program funded, if it's a food program, if it's a program that deals with mental health, is slim. Your programs have to be what's known as best practice, evidence-based type of programs to get funded. The other thing we do is community organizing and mobilizing especially in poor communities. We do strategic and tactical planning, entrepreneur, and that's definitely about creating wealth. Every nonprofit should have its own business as part of its nonprofit. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, later on. We do government procurement. The government spends trillions of dollars every year. And poor profits should be jumping on that in order to be getting that money from the government. And that's, again, that's. That's, what, that's a service that the government buys. That might be a situation where they need somebody to furnish them with chairs, or they need somebody to furnish them with catering service, any of those things. They, they own nothing. The government buys everything. But the process of getting that money is called government procurement. Then we do organizational development, sustainability, and capacity building strategy. We uh, do SS mapping and building 501c3 preparation, board training, need assessment, community building and empowerment, and finally community comprehensive programs. As you can see, we do a whole lot because what we're doing is to be able to focus on all those things that folks need to be, to take it to the next level. So I've been doing this like forever. It has said 20 years. I've been doing this for over 30 years, actually. So we started in 2007, although we became incorporated in 2011. That's when we actually got our 501c3 status. We specialize in developing neighborhood planning, economic development initiatives, and poverty stricken, stricken communities. Our approach to sustainability is framed around social entrepreneurial business model. We focus on creating national models and best practice approaches. To date, we provide technical assistance to over, that number is 1,800, actually it's over 2,000 nonprofits, government agencies, faith-based groups, businesses, and individuals. Over 300 entities we work with actually getting that nonprofit started and that we work with them and preparing the paperwork to actually become established as a nonprofit. Currently, we have worked with folks in 10 different states to get that nonprofit started from California to uh, Florida. As a matter of fact, some of our nonprofits are working um, working uh, um, um, internationally. We got nonprofits that although they operate here in, in the United States, they have reaches in Africa, the Middle East. We got nonprofits that's in Latin America, all over the world. In Florida, we're in eight different areas, including Hillsborough County and, uh, and Tallahassee. 
to date, we've been able to uh, provide and th working with different groups over $75 million. That is that when you look at the hundreds of grants that I've worked with and worked on over the years, that equate to about $75 million. If any of you are familiar with LinkedIn, um, if you go there, you'll see that I have recommendations from over 10,000 different uh, folks, anywhere from lay people to CEOs of organizations to program uh, coordinators, a whole gamut of different folks that I've come in contact with. I also encourage you to make sure that you get a LinkedIn page for your nonprofit. See, LinkedIn, unlike Facebook, LinkedIn is where all the businesses come to interact with each other. Facebook basically started out as a college type of thing, and then it, it evolved into what it is now. Now, if you notice here, this is going to talk about some of my own my other accomplishments that you can read at your leisure. Now, did everybody get a copy of this presentation? Yes. I didn't. You didn't? So I'll make sure you get a copy of this uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay. So why are we here today? 501c3. This is part one of a two-part segment. The second part of the segment is going to deal with how to write a grant. So what are your learning objectives? What should you know by the end of the day's class? First, you should know what is a nonprofit? What are bylaws? What's a purpose statement? What are articles of incorporation? What's a conflict of interest policy? What's a solicitation requirement? What, what's a 1023? What is state exemption? So a nonprofit is a public, an organization that serves a public interest. It can be a charity, it can be a, a, a faith-based group, it can be a literary, a scientific group. Uh, the focus is the, the, the one common denominator. Hold on one second, we have someone else coming in. Okay, that person will join us. So anyway, a 501c3, it's a public interest organization. Your objective is to help somebody else other than yourself. Okay. There are over 29 different types of 501C. The best type of 501C is what's known as a 501c3. With a 501c3, when people donate to your organization, they can get a tax write-off. As a matter of fact, if you try to solicit money from any of your corp major corporations, the first thing they're going to ask you is what type of 501c are you? And if you're not a 501c3, they will not fund you. Purpose. Purpose goes to the why you're starting your organization. Uh, I'll give you an example of a purpose. You have a mother that son was killed in her neighborhood. And in her neighborhood, young men are killing each other at a high rate. So because of her son's death, in her heart, she said his death would not go in vain. So what she does is to create a nonprofit. And the purpose of that nonprofit is to provide the resources next to story so that people in her neighborhood will not kill each other. That becomes her purpose. Bylaws. The first set of doc legal documents for your corporation are known by bylaws, are, by, are known as bylaws. If you drop the by, somebody tell me, what do you have? Laws. Laws. 
bylaws of a law to your organization. Let's talk about the different components of your bylaws. First, you want to have a definition of your board of directors. This is where you begin to talk about uh, your focus on a nonprofit, you're in the state of Florida, things like that. The second is qualification. You have to stipulate who qualifies to be part of your board. For example, for me, anybody that has a real concern and a passion about changing poor communities, uh, you know, they can qualify to set up my board. So everybody has their own qualification. The other is the number of directors. Uh, you should have anywhere from three to up. And the reason why you should have at least an odd number is because if you have an even number, what happens? Decisions can't be made because you have You're to do it You're never getting them done. Exactly. Let me step one back, step one back, step back one step and talk about qualification. Make sure that board members reflect the group that you want to help. So if you're a group that you want to help the homeless, make sure some of your board member actually have experienced homelessness. If you're going to do an organization that focus towards uh, working with young pe people in a neighborhood to stop them from being killed, make sure you got mothers and fathers that actually have had kids that was killed. That, that, that boy should respect at least the very population that you're serving. Okay, let's move on. Terms of directors, okay, I didn't mean to go there. Terms of uh, directors. That means that every, you have to stipulate how often are the board elected, members elected back to the board. For example, a lot of organizations have that uh, board of directors elections every four years. So that means every four years, they vote the same members in, but that's a process. So every four years, they elect the board members in if they want to, or they can elect new board members in. Resignation. Every, when, you, when you leave an organization, you should really send an official letter saying that I no longer wish to serve on the board of directors. Now, the other thing is you should have a removal clause in your bylaws. Why do you need that? Well, let's say, for example, a board member got drunk every day, came to the board meeting drunk, cussed the board members out, and the board put him off the board, told him he could no longer come, and he sues the board. And the person in the judge is going to say, well, let me look at your bylaws, because here are the laws to your organization. And if they don't say a removal clause, they're going to say, I'm sorry, you have to go back Get your board to redo your, add to your bylaws to include the clause that say any board member can be removed if two thirds of the boards decide. Some type of language like that. So you let members know that you have the power to remove them. And then comes the annual report. The annual report is that report that comes at the end of the year. This is when you begin to talk about did we achieve everything we did for the year. If not, you start to plan for the next year and make sure that what you didn't do for this year, that you do it for the next year. So the annual report looks at where we at. Did, are we where we supposed to be? Did we do what we were supposed to do? And let's start to plan for the next year. Regular meetings. You can have regular, um, all boys should have regular meetings. You can meet once a month, three times a month, it's up to your board. In those times in which the board is not meeting, then you can have what's known as special meetings. You can have a special meeting at any point. Uh, at any point, you can uh, have a special meeting when you didn't have that meeting going to regular meeting, because things come up in between meetings. Offices. Your officers can be the president, the secretary. It can be the uh, treasurer. These are what we call uh, executive committee. The executive committee is made up of other board, but it's board members with titles. The rest of the board members are just called directors. 
you have committees also. Let's say, for example, if you was, if you had that committee, if you had that nonprofit that was dealing with the numbers of killing in the community, and you might have a couple committees. One committee might be the job committee, the health people or employment committee. That's a better term. The employment committee help young people to get jobs. Another committee might be youth activity committee. Another committee might be helping unless 18 young people, 18 or over, help them in getting housing. So as you see, the committee really do the work and they report back to the board of directors on what's going on in the organization. A public statement. You want to be, you want to make sure that you identify at least one or two people from your nonprofit that's going to act on behalf of the nonprofit when that needs to be a public statement. If you run into a situation where a public statement is needed, and let's say, for example, you have 13 board members, and you got 13 board members saying 13 different things, so you always want to be precise and, 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 and make sure that certain people that's been designated speaks on behalf of the board of directors. And demification. Let's say, for example, you got your nonprofit and someone comes in and they fall and they hurt themselves real bad and they see you. Well, that person can see the corporation for whatever assets it owns or they can sue each individual board member. They can take your house, they can take your car, they can take your good dreams unless you have a clause that's called identification. And this clause says that no board member shall be responsible for the liability of the corporation. Now, you got your bottles together. The next thing you want to do is what's known as your articles of incorporation. Your articles of incorporation is that first legal document that you file with the state to become legal. The articles of incorporation in which the state can grant you that nonprofit status. But to move to the next level, you also, once you get the, once you get the approval from the state to be a nonprofit, your next level is to file what's known as the 501c3 application. Let's talk about the Articles of Incorporation. The first thing you want to have in your Articles of Incorporation is your name. Make sure you Google your name so that nobody in the world has that name. The second is duration. Basically, you want to say that you plan to be perpetual. You plan to be, on, be around forever. Because you got some corporations that come together like an LLC, they may buy a piece of land, build some houses, sell them, sell the houses, and they dissolve the corporation. A nonprofit is there for the long run. Then you want to put in your purpose. Now, what is a purpose statement? Can anybody remember what a purpose statement is? Why okay, you doing what you're doing? Say it again. Why you are doing what you're doing? Exactly. The purpose statement deal with the why. Why am I doing this? And that's important because you what what you don't know what direction you're going to be led in if you don't have a purpose. That's why they even require in the state when you file with them to put your purpose statement in there. As a matter of fact, when you file with IRS to get your 501c3, they always they also ask for your purpose statement. That's how important that purpose statement is. Then you definitely want to acknowledge your pub you serve a public benefit. And here, they're going to ask you your nonprofit nature. And this is where you put in 501c3. Personal liability. Let's say that a person, um, you had a, uh, a, you had a CEO. And the CEO was the type of person that they believe faithfully that if they wish on something, it's going to come true. So they write for a grant for, let's say, $200,000. And then they start spending the money like they had the money. 
and they find out that the grant that they thought was going to be awarded was not awarded. Now, everybody, all of your creditors are coming after you. The person that you bought computers from, the printers from, they all coming after you. Now, this is where you put in your person, personal liability clause. No board member shall be responsible for the debts of the corporation. The solution. This is when you when you dissolve as a nonprofit, you have to give your assets to either another nonprofit, a church, or the government. Please don't give it to the government. Give it to the church or another nonprofit. But at the, at the end of the day, you cannot split it up and spend it among yourselves. Prohibited distribution. Basically, to just talk about that, board members are not using the money for themselves. Restricted activities mean that you cannot, as a 501c3, support a political candidate. Candidate. You can lose your 501c3 status if you did. Now, you can support the platform, but you cannot support the person. Conflict of interest. A conflict of interest come into play if a board member receives something of value, even in terms of money or something else of value. The only board member that should receive a financial compensation uh, is the CEO. And the reason why the CEO is um, paid is because that person is responsible for running the day-to-day -day operation of the corporation. So that's why they're paid. Now, let's say, for example, a conflict of interest. Let's say, for example, you're a board member, and y'all got a youth organization, and y'all got a rain, and it's on a Sunday, and you contact the chairperson of the board, and you say, you know what? My kids are coming in town today, and I'm having a supply sweet 16 birthday party for them. But it's 15 of them, and I can't get them all around at the same time. Can I use the corporation van? That's a no-no. That's a conflict of interest. That van can only be used for the services that it was intended for. Oh, this let me go back because this is important. Now, on the other hand, if you're a for profit, then you can pay the board members. For example, people that sit on Amazon board, Walmart board, they get like in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. But nonprofit, no, no. Then you want to go online and get your EIN number. Now, when you get your EIN number, you're going to key in first your own Social Security number. Now, the reason why you key in your Social Security number is because they want to make sure you're a United States citizen. Once you, once you key in your Social Security number, it's going to drop, and then the application is going to come for you to get it for your corporation. 501c3. Now, once you have all that together, once you have the state approved, well, let's just quickly go back to what we've gone over so far. The first thing we talked about when you start an organization in terms of legal document is that you have to have your bylaws. Once you have your bylaws done, the next document was the Articles of Incorporation. That's the document that the state grants you to be a nonprofit. Now we want to move towards getting the 501c3 application. Now that we represent, now that we have been authorized by the state to serve as a nonprofit in that state, the 1023 um, is normally it takes anywhere from it takes up to three weeks. That's most of the nonprofits that come to me up to three weeks when we finish up the paperwork uh, for the uh, final file for the application for the 501c3. And normally they, it's the turnaround time, time. It's normally about uh, about three weeks. And normally it's um, in the fee for the IRS charge for this right here. It's 275. Then that's another application for 501c3. It's called more or less the long form or the EZ form. That form is six to eight hundred, and it takes anywhere from six months to a year to get. 
I always tell people do it the quickest way, the stress way. You got your authorization from the IRS, and it's called a determination letter. You take your letter into a store. You're so happy, you don't know what to do. You got your first grant, and you're ready to go spend some money. You go to the store. You got six computers you want to buy. You have to register. As before the guy ring it up, he say, here, here's my 501c3 letter. Taxes in status. And the guy tell you, no, you have to pay sale taxes. In order to avoid paying sale taxes, you have to pull out what's known as a D5, tax exemption. Now, when you go back to that store and you show that letter, because only the state can waive sale taxes, now you go back to that store, show that letter, get those five computers, and pay no sale taxes. Solicitation. Um, it's called the 10100 form, and this is probably one of the most critical documents that a nonprofit can have. Eighty-five percent of the nonprofits operating today don't have this document because they don't know or didn't know that they're supposed to uh, be licensed to operate and get money in the state of Florida. You don't have to be licensed to be a nonprofit. You have to be licensed if any money comes into your hand. Okay, and that's called solicitation. It can be by way of grants. Or it can be by way of um, by way of, um, of donations that people give. Every year you have to file this, and if you don't, there are penalties that you have to pay. Okay, any questions related to the how to start a nonprofit? I do. Come on, jump on uh, in there. Okay, in regards to. If you already have a um, LLC, one one proprietor, can that be converted into a 501c3 once you're ready to go to the next level? No, no, no. You have to actually start a 501c3. Okay. Any attempt to try to convert a full profit to a non-profit you're going to have IRS looking at your books at least every year. You're going to have the state looking at your books at least every year. Because the question becomes, hold on. This is a for-profit, and now they want to be a non-profit. What's going on with this? So you want to break away from that. Uh, an LLC, as you know, is a limited liability corporation. And you can do different forms. You can do what's known as a single member and which only one person controls that company. But nevertheless, it is considered to be a for-profit type of uh, corporation. And a lot of people, um, is that somebody trying to come in? Or oh, somebody has their hand up. Who has their hand up? Oh, yeah, that's me. I'm waiting for you to finish your answer. Then I'd like to answer. Oh, you threw me off, right? So anyway, what was I talking about? You didn't threw me off when you put your hand up. <laughs> oh, what, was, what was I talking about? <laughs> no, I right. yeah, put it down. <laughs> now, what was that again I was talking about? Converting from an LLC to a yes, non Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Claire. I appreciate it. So, yeah, because the, an LLC is a full profit. And what happens, a lot of people meet people, and they say, I want to do an LLC. And the person knows nothing about a non-profit. And they say, sure, we're, you can just start a non-profit as an LLC. And then they'd be wondering, why nobody give me no money? Why every time I'm writing for a grant? Because immediately, when someone sees LLC, <laughs> immediately, that's why you definitely want to separate it from that LLC. You want to do a separate, um, now what's the name of your LLC? Sold Out for Jesus Initiative. And you can do that and put and put another word in there, plus, or something like that, and create okay. your nonprofit. All you need to do is put in one, one word. And then you can keep your you can keep the same things you've got, but if you put add one word, then then you can convert it over to a nonprofit. And then, cause that way, if you try to do it as a nonprofit, the state going to say, hold on, you can't, cause somebody has this name as an LLC. 
and you say, well, it's my name. They say, nevertheless, someone has it. So that's okay. why you don't want to go through all the hassle. Make it easy, because all we want to do is help people. So let's do it the easiest way possible. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question, please. Uh, so you mentioned that there's the three-week um, form and then there's the six to eight months form. Is that two different kind of applications? Well, it's, it's income sensitive. With the first one, the 275, what you're saying to the government is that we don't intend to uh, uh, make anything over 25, 50,000 within our first year, first three years. I'll project it, huh? Nothing. Oh, um, in the first three years. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You gonna, That's what you're saying to the government, okay? Yeah. Now you can do that. Although, let's say that that same year you get four hundred thousand dollars. That's not a problem because when you initially started, that's what they're gonna look at. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you say to the government, "Well, look, we have, we're gonna make." over 50,000, as a matter of fact, we know that because we got $100,000 in the bank. Well, mm -hmm. under, under that, you have to file the more complicated form. What is that one oh, called? It's called the 1023EZ. Okay, because we're trying to establish a school and raise funds for that school. The so question, how much money do you have right now in the bank? Oh, we don't have anything, it's a brand new Okay, what I'm telling you, go for the 501C, um, um, go for the 501c, uh, 501c3 easy, the, the, the one for 275. And then if we switch to the other one, is it an easy process? What's that? To, to, if we switch to the 1023? Well, it's not a question of switching to the 1023. The question is which 1023? If the 1020, and then keep in mind, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm moving away from the LLC, and I'm saying create a new nonprofit. And that new nonprofit that you create, when you go to file your status, you can be able to do the one for 275. That's the 1023 easy. Or you can do the 1023 um, 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 long form. Both are tax exempt form. One form said, look, government, we're a small nonprofit. We don't have that. We don't have money. We don't know if we're going to make money in three years. And the government said, "Yeah, come on. We're going to give you that status in three weeks." On the other hand, we say, "Hey, government, we have at least a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand in our bank now." Then they're going to make you pull out the long form. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have anything right now, but that's one... why I'm saying you want to go with the easy one. When money come in, that's not you're not penalized if you get money. But we're planning on doing a fundraiser to raise money to build the school. And That's you can't do that, but you don't have that right now. Oh, okay. So keep so in mind, this is called projected. Okay. See, it's projected. Now, let's say you did that fundraiser and you received nothing, but yet you told the government you was going to make a hundred or two hundred thousand now. You see where I'm going at? Yeah, yeah, I got you. It's projected. That's why you want to go that way, unless you have it. Now, keep in mind, if it got that money already, it's different. Oh, no, we don't have it yet. Yeah, but if it's something but once you hope... we get it, then the end of the year, we got to switch. No. Well, it's, no, it's, you don't even have to switch. Let's say, for example, you told the federal government that you wasn't going to make that twenty twenty five thousand mm now, -hmm. and you did a fundraiser, and you made 200000 The mm -hmm. feds don't care. You still a 501c3. Okay, I got you. Because so you still have to file your taxes. So yeah. it's not like... You're not going to come back and say, this is what we actually made. Okay. See, okay. that's when you report it, when you actually made it. I'm sorry, folks. I didn't mean to stay that long on that one. But anyway, that's important. So let's go to the grant now. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what are, uh, what are our learning objectives for today. First, you should be able to describe the different types of grants, the different types of grantors. You should be identified. I'm sorry, you should be able to identify research tools available to the grant seeker, fundraising, proposal writing, and you should be able, at this, at the end, you should be able to talk about what are my next steps. Types of grants. The first type of grant is an unrestricted grant. And these grants are for general purposes. So one, a person give you $100,000 a uh, grant, and they said, look, you can use this to pay the executive director, you can use this to pay whatever. 
You can use this to buy a van for your organization, whatever. It's called unrestricted. Most grants are called restricted grants. The first type of restricted grant is called a program or project grant. So let's say, for example, in the case of a person that wants to battle teenage pregnancy from the ages, let's say, of 12 to 18. And that, and that program that focuses on teenage pregnancy, and they write a grant to say, look, these are the people we want to help. These teenagers have been pregnant, and we want to make sure they don't have another baby. And then at some point, you're saying to yourself, if your pro as your program is running, a lot of people are coming to your program that are not pregnant, but they like to come to your program because, you know, they heard it's a good program and it could help them. You can't help those people because it's called a restricted grant. That restricted grant is only for teen, teens that are pregnant. In the unrestricted grant, the first type of grant, you can help anybody. But when you go for a restricted grant, it's, re it's related to the specific people that you say you're going to help. The next type of grant is called a seed money. This is, for example, in, in, in addition to having experimental program and innovative projects, another thing you get seed, seed money for is when you just getting started. And you're saying, now, who should be the first person you bring on board when you start your nonprofit? A grant writer. Another grant writer. <laughs> Now, the first person that you bring on to your board, your organization, is the CEO president. That will be your first grant. Now, once the CEO, CEO gets on board, that person is responsible for bringing in grant writers and program money. But the first person, because you're just getting started, keep in mind, you have no staff. And basically what you're saying to the funder we want to solve this problem, but in order to do it, we need to be able to be brought to capacity. And you're brought to capacity because what you're saying is that behind, behind an exec, a CEO who's going to take us to that level. Then you have what's known as capital grants. Capital grants is when you want to buy a building or when you want to buy a piece of land related to your nonprofit. Then you have what's known as an endowment. And I list endowments because it's a type of grant, but actually only colleges and universities actually get this money. Somebody die or somebody get big time money and they give it to the university or the college. It's called an endowment. Then you can get what's known as challenge uh, or matching grants. So let's say, for example, you wrote a grant for 100000 And the grant, uh, we got one more person coming in. Let's submit that person. Okay. And the grantor, uh, the grantor says to you, even though you want a hundred thousand, we will give you eighty thousand. That means you have to find twenty thousand. You have to find twenty thousand somewhere else. How hard do you think, given these time, it's going to be hard? How hard do you think it's going to be to find $20,000? Anybody? Real hard. Well, that's why you're in this class today. Because let me give you a reality check. There are over 10,000 foundations and corporations that get money every day. Most of us only know about 5%. And we're going to talk later on about where can we find those people? Where can we find those people? And then the other type of grant is called in-kind support. This is when somebody donate time to your organization when they volunteer to your organization. Okay. Okay, there we go. Now, grant tours. These are the people that give up the moolah, the money, the green. Let's talk about the different sources. First, the individual, like you and I. We give the largest amount of money. Anywhere from people that uh, pay their tithes, that's a form of donation, to people that buy Girl Scout cookies, that's a form of donations. 
uh, to people that uh, just give donation to a charity organization. The next type is called a family and or community foundation. A family foundation is that foundation that that's a biological connection between the people that operate it. It might be a mother and a father, a sister and a brother, like the Obama Foundation, it's family. The Clinton Foundation, it's family. Or the uh, Bill Gates Foundation, it's family. Then you have what's known as community foundation. Community foundations like here in Tampa, they call them the Hillsborough County Children's Board. So that means that if you are in Hillsborough County, and if you submit a proposal to the Hillsborough County Children's Board, and by the way, they give out $41 million every year, and you submit a proposal to them uh, 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 for a youth program, and you from Miami, the likelihood of you getting that grant is none because it's a community foundation. It's like the Tampa Bay Foundation. If you try to submit a proposal into the Tampa Bay Foundation and you're from, let's say, New York, it's not going to happen. It's called Community Foundation, and they fund only in their community. The next type is called a corporate foundation, which is made out of corporate corporations. I'll give you an example of corporate, oh, there's so many of them. BP, Bank of America, um, 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 Safeway, uh, Target, Best Buy. I can go on and on and on. But what you need to know is that by law, up to 5% of the net profits of a foundation that wants to act as a corporate foundation, that's up to 5% of the net proceeds, and that's the net proceeds, must go to uh, other, uh, must go to a 501c3 corporation. Now, is 5% of net proceeds a lot of money, folks? Depends on how much the, 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 The lump sum. That's, the, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's a lot of money. If you're uh, Amazon and you make $5 trillion, do you know what 5% of 5 you know what 5% of $5 trillion is? So anyway, you see what I'm saying? It's big numbers. Because we're talking about big corporations and 5% of that net proceeds. Because a lot of people see that 5% number and they don't understand no corporations make big money. Okay, the only thing I'm going to ask, why do you think that corporations give money to nonprofits? Right up to the taxes at the end you, of the year. 80% to 90% of the people answer that question the way you did it. The fact of the matter, the fact of the matter is corporations for the most part pay little or no taxes. Why? They got accountants and they got lawyers. So the reason why they're doing it is because it's social conscious, social responsibility. Hey, look, we give money to help poor communities, for animals, for water, for the environment. That's so they can boost that they're giving back. That's why they give money. It's not taxes. They got their lawyers in their account. As a matter of fact, last year, Amazon paid no taxes. So it's not taxes. So then you, and the next one is your federated funds, like the United Way. And then, of course, you have finally your government funds. And that can be anywhere from state, local, and federal uh, money. Let's talk about where the money is. I talked about the 10,000 foundations and corporations that's out there. Let's talk about how do we find them. And I'm, I want you to home in on best the, those things that I have in red. Now, all of these ones that you see on a, the list for research tools, uh, you can go there, but the best ones are the ones I have in red. The first is the Foundation Center. So let's say, for example, someone give me an example of what type of program they want to do it and where they want it, what state they want to do it, and what city they want to do it in. This one. 
uh, I could go like a school project in New Tampa. What type of program? A school. What type of program? School. What type? Pacific. Oh, uh, to teaching uh, bilingual schools to bring in critical languages. Okay. Okay. Or a green so. School. Okay. Let's say bilingual. That's the program you want to get funded. Mm -hmm. Where? Did you say in Tampa? Where did you say? New Tampa, yeah, Tampa. New Tampa. So you type in Tampa, and then you type in 100,000. Everybody that's giving money throughout the world for um, 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 bilingual, bi multi-language, mm -hmm. and Tampa, and giving $100,000 will come up. And what do you do? First, you choose the first five on the list. Now, what happens if you don't get that grant from the first five? No idea. Go to the next five. Huh? Go to the next five. You go to the next five, exactly. That's what the grant game is all about, the numbers, you know? So once, you, once now you know where to get the money, you know how to get the money. So if the first five, the first 10, you just go to the next five and the next five. Keep in mind, that's over 10,000 foundations and corporations that give out money. And the reality is that if you try to Google it, you're only going to find 5% 5 of those folks that's giving money. What the Foundation Center did was to create a, uh, a clearinghouse on all of those uh, foundations. So you have to go through them to get to that money. Okay, so. To, I'm sorry, was that, was that a question? And I'm, I, think, I think somebody's on the phone. Oh, look, I'm going, I'm going to have to move everybody. I'm sorry. Um, hold on for one second. Just raise your hand if you need to talk to me. Or oh, maybe they're off the phone now. Okay, so um, grant.gov is where you go if you want to do a federal grant. So let's say, for example, you want to get money for a youth after school program. Or if you want to get a plan, a money for a homeless program. To increase your chances of getting that grant, you want to do a couple of things. First, make sure you read it. A lot of, you might say that's stupid, but a lot of people don't even read it. They make an assumption, for example, oh, this is your friend. Okay, let me go see what the different parts they want me to put in, and I'll put in the different parts to make up the grant and submit it. But they don't read the whole grant because the grant that they submitted was for young people between 18 and 24, yet if they, if they had read the grant, the grant was for young people between the ages of 12 to 18. Always read the grant. And then talk to somebody that received that grant last year. Talk to somebody that was part of the team that awarded that grant. They sat on the team to award that grant. And finally, talk to someone who is a program officer. Every time a grant comes out, they have a contact person. Now, you can get this information related to the, 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 uh, the organization that received it last year, the person that reviewed it last year from the foundation center when you go after that grant. So let's say you're going after Bank of America. When you go to the foundation center, you put in Bank of America, and you put in Bank of America 2019. So you can say, okay, who got that grant last year? Oh, who sat on that team to, to do that? Because it's public money related to 501c3, they have to publish that. So then you're going to call that person that received that grant. You're going to call that person that was part of the grant, the, the team that awarded that grant. And you're going to say, hey, can I take you out to lunch? Take them to McDonald's. Don't take them to nowhere expensive, right? Because you'd be on 60 minutes. They'd be saying, how do you take, how is a poor organization take somebody to a five-star restaurant? Anyway, you see my point. Mm -hmm. And the reason why the person is going to help you that received that grant last year, A, because you buying them lunch, B, because most nonprofits like to help each other unless they're going for that same grant. But because that nonprofit received that grant last year, 
they can't go for it. So they don't mind helping you out and give you some ideas. Now, if you use this strategy, read your grant. Talk to someone that received it. Talk to someone that was awarded the letter and talk to the program officer. You got an 80% chance of getting that grant out the bag. So okay. you can only apply one year, isn't it reoccurring every year? More and more organizations are doing it like once a year. Yeah, more and more. Now some organizations might give you a grant, a multi-grant for three years, but even that then comes up because you're still going to have to be competitive that you get it the second year. Means that if somebody else submitted a proposal and that proposal is better than yours, then you're not getting funding for, the, for that year or the remaining year. Grants are highly competitive. All right. Now, the first thing you want to talk about when you start to write a grant is the statement of the problem. The problem is, what conditions are you trying to change? Throughout this presentation, the example we want to use is um, we're going to use school dropout. That's going to be the focus group. Statement of the problem. So the problem, young people, people in poor communities are dropping out of school and not finishing school. That's going to be a statement of the problem. Now, the statement of the problem should talk about the importance and significance of that problem. You should talk about the fact that if you don't solve the problem, the problem is not going to be solved. Now, you want to be able to provide both quantitative and qualitative research in order to support your claim of what the problem is. Let's talk about the different types of research strategy. The first is called quantitative research. Quantitative research deals with the, the, the what, the how many. So let's say, for example, and it deals with the why. Let's say, for example, you're dealing with um, the dropouts. So the first thing you're going to do, you're going to go to Google and type how many people drop out of school in, let's say, Tampa every year. That number going to come back. That's what we call quantitative. That's the first thing on part of your grant. It's going to say, according to the Hillsborough County School Board, in any given year, 13,000 uh, students drop out before they complete. Then you got to deal with the why. And you're going to go to Google. You're going to type in, why do young people drop out of school? You're going to get all these different types of studies. And when you write your grant, you're going to say, dealing with the quantitative, according to the Hillsborough County school system, over 5,000 young people drop out of school. According to a study that was done by the University of Tampa, in 2019, they found that the number one reason why young people was dropping out of school was because they were attracted by other things. I'm just hypothetically talking. That doesn't even have to be true. But you want to be able to show the why. Another why might be they drop them out of school because they think school cannot get them to where they need to get to. That's quantitative. Then you have to do the qualitative research. Qualitative research is subjective. In qualitative research, you are trying to feel, get what the person really feels. And you do quantitative research in a couple of ways. You can do a focus group. You can do an interview. You can do a survey, or you can do a questionnaire. Let's say you, did, you decided to do a uh, focus group. Back to my favorite place in McDonald's. You bring together five people that dropped out of school. They eat McDonald's and everything. And you're going to ask them a number of questions. Why did you drop out of school? And you might ask, what would it take to get you back in school? And you might ask, what is it about 
being out of school is better than being in school. That's going to be part of your qualitative research. So when you submit that grant now, first you're going to submit your qualitative research. You're going to say, based on the Hinsville County Department of Education, in 2019, 5,000 kids dropped off. Based on a study did by the University of Tampa, here's the reason why they drop out. And based on research from our focus groups, this is why they are saying they drop out. Okay, let's continue. So is it is that understandable? Anybody, any questions? That was kind of kind of a lot of information I was throwing at you at once. So is everybody does that everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Good. Good. Okay, so you got the problem. You know what the problem is. Now, the next part is the program. How do you solve the problem? And we solve the problem by designing a program or a project. Now, first we got to get a concept of what we're doing. In order to get a concept of what we're doing, we need to create goals and objectives. A goal is really about the final impact or outcome that you wish to bring about. Let's go back to the case of the um, people that's dropping out of school. So your goal would be to reduce the number of kids dropping out of school. Remember, your problem was dropout. When you convert it into a goal, now you can you convert it into a statement saying this is what the final outcome is going to look like our final outcome outcome by way of goal reduce the number of young people that's dropping out of school how do we do this you do this by what we call objectives objectives talk about your steps you're going to take for example from your goal one of your objectives might be to create a mentor program Another might be to create an after-school program. Another might be is to match students with, um, with um, 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 tutors. Another might be that for those that drop out, to create a GED program. So as you see, it goes from your goal to your objectives. So now you got your goals and objectives. Now we talk. Now we got to do design the program. We know what our goals are, and we know what our objectives are. So this is called the method section of the program design. A couple of things should be part of your program design. I'm not going to say everything. I'm only going to touch on something. And you can look at this at your leisure. So let's talk about a couple of things. First, it should include a description of your personnel. Who are you going to hire? What are their qualifications? It should include, again, this is your program design. It should include your facilities. Where do you plan to operate under? What equipment do you need? What materials do you need? It should talk about what is your scope, scope of service? How are you going to administer the program? Who is your target population? In this case, who's the target population? Y'all remember? High school dropouts, 18. Exactly, exactly. High school dropout, capital two. And then what you want to do is in a chronological order, you have to talk about what you plan to do from day one when you get that award letter to when you close up. Question, what do you want to do your first 30 days? Anybody? I want to set, establish a building, get a building is, you know, set that that's, up. That's, that for something even more important. First 30 days. I'll tell you. A the plan. First, no, that's why you got the grant, because you have a plan. You can't get a plan now. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to have that plan. That's why we gave you the money. But the first 30 days is when you hire your employees. Mm -hmm. Even though you know who you want to hire, technically it has to be part of your chronological order. So you have to have somebody in there that the first 30 days we plan to do this. We plan to submit an article in a newspaper about the job position. We plan to have people to come in 
for the interview. We plan to bring them back for a second interview, and we plan to bring the uh, staff on board. Now, in addition to that, we're going to secure our building. We're going to put together our application, our forms that we need. We're going to have together all the materials that we need as it relates to that. Now, after that, in the next 45 days to 60 days, that's when you start to do your outreach. So if you're dealing with, if you're dealing with people that drop out of school, you got to add in the program. You say, self assistance is calling a program, starting a program. If you've dropped out of school and you want to get your GED, or if you want help in getting a job, come to our orientation. So during that orientation, you're going to start to draft the people that's going to come in, and then you're going to have a waiting list because most times it's going to be more. And that's when you're going to start administering your programs. Another part of the grant is called the introduction. The introduction is the, um, is the um, requirements for most corporations and foundations. In your introduction, it's number about one to one and a half pages. And it normally talks about your credibility. This is where you begin to talk about your board of directors and any experience that your board has that will make that corporation operate. Conclusion. Normally when you write a grant, nowhere in the grant, or people concerned about your feelings. You should never talk about your feelings unless you get to the conclusion. The last paragraph. This is where you can express your conclusion. So let's talk about the person that's doing a nonprofit for kids that's dropping out of school. This is where that person say that I dropped out of school when I was 15. And as a result of that, my whole life has been hard pressed because I didn't have a high school diploma. And I know what it means to struggle without that. So because of that, that's why I'm starting a nonprofit to help kids that are dropping out of school. Then you want to put in there your um, information about your organization your newsletter, your website, your pamphlets, your press release. Here's what's important, folks. All media, be it electronic media, newsletters, or whatever, has to designate on there a, a line that says uh, funds awarded by, like Bank of America. Uh, you need to recognize who gave you the money. And you need to recognize that on all your print materials. OK, and then you want to get down to your append appendix. You want to have all of your articles, any articles that was written about your organization, the board members, recent annual reports, organizational physical reports, past success stories, and letters of support. Question. Who do you need to get a letter of support from if you're doing a program for dropouts? School. One, yes. Who else? Parents. Well, parents too, but you want to get the city council because they're going to say it's a problem. The police department say, yeah, when they drop out of school, they hang on the corner. You want to get all these organizations that share like you that is a problem. And every organization might have a different reason. For example, the health department might say, yeah, we support it, because when they we find that when young people drop out of school, there's a high potency of teenage pregnancy. So everybody is going to be writing you a letter as a letter of support. That's what we mean by letter of support. Apparently, it's very important. So if I tell you to double space and you don't double space, what do you think gonna happen with your grant? In the trash. If I tell you to um, use time, new time Roman front, and you use cursy, in the trash. People fail to understand this is not school, you don't get a grade. <laughs> if you don't do even the smallest thing, they don't even look at your proposal. 
Now, you got your program together. You've already identified your problem. Now you have to evaluate. You have to show how do you know and how do you know and what does success look like? Success look like. We call it evaluation. When you're doing an evaluation, you can do a goal-based evaluation, a process-based evaluation, an outcome-based evaluation. Let's talk about the individual evaluation. The first type of evaluation is called a goal-based evaluation. This is when you're evaluating whether or not your activities that you're doing and the outcome that's coming about is consistent with your goals and objectives. So what do I mean? So we stated earlier that our goal was to reduce high school dropout. And we talk about our objectives, mentor program, after school program, GED program. But when we start to do our activities, our activities is senior citizens jumping rope. It's not consistent with your goal and your objective. That's why you have to do a goal-based evaluation so everybody know that your goals and objectives is consistent with your outcomes and your activities. This is called an outcome-based evaluation, a logic model. The resource section talks about what you need. For example, you might say, we need staff, we need a building, um, we need a van. The activities section talks about what activities you plan to do. The output section talks about how many people you plan to do it for. Your short and long-term outcomes now, outcomes differ from outputs. Outputs is how many. Outcomes is what's going to be the benefit. So in the case of the mentor program, for the person that dropped out of school, this is going to be the activity. The outcome is going to be now that young person is going to be back in school or they're going to have that high school diploma. That's going to be the output outcome. The impact, because you have to show your impact. So the impact of this person getting that GED means an A. They're not going to be dependent upon social service. They're going to be a homeowner. More than likely, they would have finished college. They're going to have a good job, and they're going to be a productive member in society. Theory of change. Your theory of change talked about what's the process that you're going to bring about the outcome that you're talking about. Well, of course, we're going to talk about the problem. That's the first block. And then the one on the end is the outcome. We know all about that. The in-between box is called intervention. It's going to be your design and doses statement. For example, if you're going to do a mentor program, here you will put the mentor program is going to be six months. The mentor program is going to be weekly. The mentor program is going to be three hours per session for a total of 30 sessions. And here's the materials that we're going to use to gauge what we're doing, the best practice materials we're going to use. Okay, now we talked about the problem. We talk about the program. We talk about the evaluation. Now let's talk about the organization. Organization capacity goes to the why, the who, the what, the how, the how much. This is critical. When you begin to address these questions, you want to make sure you have organizational infrastructure. You want to have policies and procedures in place. You want to have at least a job description for the staff you're going to need. You at least want to have a conversation on how you plan to be financial sustainable. You want to talk about how do you plan to put in physical controls. And you want to talk about 
how are you going to um, access, what access to support resources are you, are you going to go for that is sustainable? The five-year plan. Five years to stretch your plan. All major funders look for this. And your five-year plan, and I've done five-year plan that was 30, 40, 100 pages long. In your five-year plans, these are the most important parts. You should have your goals, your strategy, your objectives, your tactics, your operations and methods, and your budget. Now, in the grant, grant games, it's all about putting a little bit more in than the next person. What you're looking at now is a SWOT analogy. A SWOT analogy is normally what corporate America does. Your top 500 for 500 clubs. See, as a nonprofit, you want to increase your, your ability to read that grant to say that we might be a nonprofit, but we also do a SWOT analogy. And what a SWOT analogy does is identify your weaknesses, your strengths, your opportunities, and your threats. You normally do this during your second or third year of operation. You impress the grantor because you say, we might be a nonprofit, but we operate under a business model. That is, we're subjected to the same standard as if we was a Fortune 500 corporation. That's what we call a new generation thinking for nonprofits. So, Let's talk about the key components of a strong organization. Your values. Your values go to what do you believe in? Your mission. Your mission is why we exist. Your vision. Your vision is where, do we, where are we going at? Your strategy. Your strategy is how will we get there and your tactics. And your tactics is what will we do to get there? Let me back up to talk about vision. Dr. King had a dream. That dream is what's called a vision. A vision is always futuristic. It's the way you want the world to look. Not the way the world looks now. For example, Dr. King, when he did his I Had a Dream speech, there was a time when black people couldn't eat at the same counter, go to the same schools, use the same bathroom. So he closed his eyes and he created, I have a dream. The dream is the vision. And every organization has to have a vision. Every organization, like for example, the organization is dealing with uh, young people that drop out of school. Their vision will be a world where no one, where no, where everyone has an opportunity and a second chance to return back to school. And that'd be GED or regular school. So far, so good. Everybody on point? On point. All right, all right. Now, okay. We're almost finished, y'all. So don't worry about it. We're almost finished. So, Let's talk about the other critical documents that you're going to need. First, you need a business plan, an operational plan, a financial management plan, a fundraising plan. Someone mentioned fundraising earlier. A fundraising plan, a safety and risk management plan. And people often ask me, what is a safety and risk management plan? That's a plan that shows that you're not going to take risks and how you're gonna deal with any risk that might come into play. The easiest observation is when someone's dropped water on the floor in your office and the water stays there and no one does anything and someone hurts himself. According to safety and risk management, if someone sees in your organization water on the floor, they're supposed to put something there so people won't walk over it. That's what we mean by safety and risk management. Making sure that you're taking all the necessary cautions that people don't find themselves in a bad situation. 
And then we come to marketing and branding. You have to market your organization and you definitely got to brand it. Every organization has to have partnerships and, collab and collaborative funding. Okay, so what do we have so far? We got a problem. We got our program. We got our evaluation. Now, let's talk about how do you fund it. We even got our organizational structure together. Now, let's talk about how do you fund it. Funding sustainability. Social entrepreneurship. When I, when I work with nonprofits, I work with nonprofits using a new generation approach. And that new generation approach means that the programs that you're putting together and projects that you're putting together are evidence-based best practice programs. The other growth pattern related to um, strong organization is how do you bring in income to sustain the programs? It's called social entrepreneurship. It's the earned income you use to pursue social objectives by simultaneously seeking both financial and social and social returns on your investment. In other words, the ability to fund the future of nonprofits through a combination of earned income, charitable contributions, and public sector subsidies. So let's talk about that. How do we bring in revenue? Well, the first thing we do, let me bring this down, is grants. Traditionally, mom poppers write grants. non poppers that only write grants don't live long. So let's talk about how do we change that. The other thing you do in addition to writing grants is you begin to charge fees for your service. If you're into housing development, housing, you do you build houses and you get the development fees. If you build good at what you do, you make money for your organization by becoming a consultant and going around the country and teaching other nonprofits on what your nonprofits do, and you get a fee for that. Most importantly, you want to own and operate your own business. That's where most money comes into play. Sound nonprofits move away from having a hundred percent income coming from grants to having at least sixty to seventy percent of their income coming from earned income. And that earned income can be from owning your own business. As a matter of fact, the children's board, Bank of America, and a lot of people will give nonprofits money if they start their own business. But that business has to be consistent with your mission and your goal. So if you're doing a nonprofit business related to those that drop out of school, well, the business you start must use them. So let's say, for example, you're using those people that drop out of school, and now you start a tutoring service. And that tutoring service once you get these people to drop out of school, children's service is going to teach people from wealthy community, going to teach their kids. And you, that way you're going to bring income into your organization. Or if you're a youth organization, you can start a t-shirt shop. And the young people will run it, and the money will come in to the nonprofit. Or if you're a youth organization, and, and they did this in, in Tampa, you can start an ice cream shop. The bottom line is that whatever business you go into, it has to be consistent with the people that you serve. Okay, and so, and the other thing, and this is important too, there are two other ways to get money as a nonprofit. First is to invest. You want to invest in stocks and bonds and other financial security. Again, a new, this is a new way of thinking, a new generation of thinking. Because now when you invest in bonds, securities, guess what? Every, every month, your nonprofit got a check coming in called a return order, uh, return um, 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 
earnings. And you're going to use that money now to fund your nonprofit. That money is working for you now. That investment that you made 10 years from now, you'll be getting a check every month. The other thing you want to do is start to no negotiate with the private sector yourself. Don't go through the middleman. Negotiate on your own with the private sector to bring deals to your community and to your organization. Okay, so the money that comes in, the way it goes out is what we call output. Output is that the money goes to employment program, public safety, etc. Then the um, outcome from that is that uh, we increase employment, for example, we increase uh, affordable homes. Another thing you do when you start to bring in money, you benefit the city. Because now you reduce the tax base that the city is paying, the service that's required. There's a number of things that you can show that the cost of your investment into your organization, for example, if you was going to school, our school, uh, uh, out, if you was on a, um, a program for, out, for dropouts, you would have, under benefits, you might have uh, um, reduced crime. You might have more educated people. But you always want to create a chart like this to show what the input, output, outcome, and benefit comes from the investment in your organization. The budget. Okay, now. We talked about the problem. We talked about the program. We talked about the evaluation. We talked about the organization. We talked about how to get money, the funding section of it. Now we need to get with how do you control the money? It's called a budget. And in a budget, you got two types of um, costs. No, you got four types. First is direct costs. Direct cost is that co that cost of money for people who are, let's say, in a, in a, an example, of the high school dropout program. The direct po the direct cost would be that money paid for a counselor to come in and help the person or teachers. It's directly it's part of direct service to your client. However, in order to run an organization, you also have to have what's known as indirect costs. Indirect costs is administrative costs. Or it can be money for a lawyer or your accountant. It's money that your organization has to pay in order to stay functional. And then you got cost sharing. Cost sharing, if you decide to cost, share the cost of an operation with another nonprofit, and of course you have in kind. So that becomes the um, that becomes the um, the class uh, uh, presentation. As you can see, we have over, um, what, we have over, um, we've already have over 1,800 nonprofits to try to get that thing together. So, any, and I'm, I'm glad we have a good turnout in class today. So, that being said, any other question? So, what is the makeup? I'm sorry, I should have raised my hand. Somebody was already speaking. Let me raise my hand. <laughs> no, you're fine. Okay. You haven't said anything, so go ahead. I'll wait to talk to you. Okay, go ahead. Somebody just do something. <laughs> Anybody? Say something. Anybody had a question? Okay, I want a good note. So this scene today it seemed like you gave us a general overview um, <laughs> of starting a 503, 501c3. Now, yes. I see all the dates that's listed. It's about a week worth of, of classes that we are, are going to be attending. No, During, these are the same classes. Oh, it's, so, it's just yes. different dates that it's on. Yes, exactly. So if we miss something or we think we yeah, want to hear exactly. something. A lot of people come back because they miss oh, something. Oh, okay. Yeah, a lot of people miss something. It's the same materials, but a lot of people, because it's so much materials, a lot of people come back because they say, did I hear this? So was that the thing? So yeah, that's that's why we do it multiple times. Now, is there ever a time where, um, you know, we kind of get some hands-on training within well, the Zoom environment? Or you just want us to just go at it and when do we discuss? Oh, no. Hey, let's say, for example, let's say, for example, you say, 
Mike, I like what your nonprofit is doing. I want to bring y'all on in order to prepare our paperwork. I want y'all to complete our auditors of incorporation, our bylaw, all those different documents that we talk about in the first section. We'll prepare all of those documents. The solicitation, all of these, if you want to come to us to prepare. The problem is, for example, when you go to someone else to do your paperwork, they will charge you like Legal Zoom. This is an organization that helps people with their nonprofit. What they don't tell you is that they only do your 501c3 paperwork or your articles, but they don't do all of those other documents uh, that we talked about in class. That's why I make sure people attend this class so people don't play them when they go to get service. When someone says to them, yeah, I'll do your articles on corporation, I'll do your uh, 501c3, but they're not telling people, oh, you have to be licensed to do this. Oh, you have to have a um, you have to have a uh, uh, a, a a state uh, uh, exemption to do to waive sales taxes. So they don't do that. That's why as a nonprofit, we make sure all nonprofits uh, uh, know everything they need because what a lot of times nonprofits operating five years later, the state come knocking on the door. You're not license to operate in the state. And the first thing you're going to say, but I got my 501c3. And they say, that's a federal thing. That's tax exempt. You have to be licensed by us. So that's that's an example. But yeah, like I said, we've been, uh, it's, when you look at over 10 states that, that people came to us uh, to get that nonprofit started, they now in 10 different states all over the place. So we provide that service also if you want to take it to the next level. Okay. And wh what is the fee scale like? Well, it's $400 for us to prepare all of the paperwork. Now, again, if you go to Zoom, legal Zoom, they're charging you $1,200 just to do three documents. See, what happened with us, when you give money to us, because you, we're non -pop, it's just like a donation. You know, it goes back so we can do free workshops and all these other things that we do for your charge. See, nonprofits have to operate their business in order to continue to service your client. Gotcha. For example, someone talked about they wanted to do a, what was that, an after school program? What type of program was that? She wanted to do a school. She wants to create you? a school, a uh -huh. bilingual yeah, school. school. Exactly. So that means that you got to bring in money. That means you got to create like a business. So what you're doing, you're saying, look, if the child is poor, we're going to do a grant. If the child's coming from a well-to-do neighborhood, guess what? We're charging a fee. That's how you operate. You got to operate from a business perspective, and you cannot operate from only grants. And that's what we teach nonprofit. Think like a business. That's how you survive. Okay. okay. So if, if, if that's it, I want to stop. I want to um, definitely thank everybody. Thank you. Uh, Thank for you. Class today. Uh, I, I love this. I tell you, I love this because you're going to hand out that whenever you meet somebody and they say, oh, I'm a new generation class. No, Pop, you know what class they took. You know what class they took. What they trying to say, the old way, the non-profit non did work? Oh, no. We are new school, new generation non-profits. Now, feel free, I, and I'm going to send y'all, I think I have all of your emails, so I'll be sending you some information about my, um, about my service. But more importantly, I just want to make sure that everybody got a better understanding of nonprofits prior to coming to class. That's what's most important to me as a, as a nonprofit. Because yes. most people that leave my class, come to my, and they say, are you sure we're not supposed to pay something? Well, that's why you don't pay, because we help people to start that nonprofit. That allows us to do free classes. So again, everybody, yeah. thank you, and go out there and look, save the world. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All thank right, you. thanks again. See y'all later. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. All right, thanks again. <laughs>